Hi everyone and welcome to this video about depression. So in our last Healthy Minds videos we talked about anxiety and went through some of the symptoms and their treatments as well. Today we'll be doing the same thing but applying those things to depression instead. So a reminder that this is where we're sitting um, at the moment. So we've done the anxiety disorders, now we're doing the affective disorders but we'll only be focusing on depression. Now remember, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, so please don't um, try and diagnose or treat those that you know. By all means, use it as a conversation starter if there's someone you're worried about, but um, make sure that you're not doing that because you're not qualified. Um, also, be aware of medical student syndrome. So if it raises questions, this video, um, consult the resources that we have on our website. So what is depression? So just like anxiety, Feeling depressed is very normal, particularly if something sad happens in your life. Okay? But clinical depression is very different. So this is an extended experience of extremely negative emotions, thoughts and behaviours that impair your functioning and that happen for at least two weeks. So um, we call this a depressive episode or a major depressive episode um, and the recurrence of that is when you then have um, a disorder. So it's not just a feeling of sadness. It's not something people can snap out of. Um, and it causes significant distress and it also impairs people's ability to be able to do day-to-day -day things. So as I said, so if you have five or more of these symptoms within a two-week period, that's referred to as a depressive episode. Um, and then the recurrence of that is then the disorder. Okay, so um, these symptoms cause significant distress in these areas. So you could have a depressed mood. Now, it's not just feeling sad. It's significant depression most of the day, every day for two weeks. So very significant there. Diminished interest or pleasure in activity. So not doing things that you used to enjoy doing or not getting joy from those things. Significant weight loss or gain. And this is without trying. And it's usually tied pretty closely to a change in your appetite. Insomnia or difficulties um, sleeping. Extreme restlessness or slowness, so it could be one or the other, depending on the person. Significant fatigue and loss of energy. This is quite common, this one. Uh, feelings of worthlessness or guilt and impaired thinking, concentration, decision-making, memory, etc. Um, and then recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. So these people don't have to have all of them. Um, some of the big ones are the pleasure and activities and the mood as well. So in terms of causes, there isn't one be-all and end-all cause that will definitely ensure that you have depression. That's not really how it works. But it can be some of these factors. They can also work together. Um, and the first one is an imbalance in your brain chemistry. So we know that dopamine is one of those happy hormones and it talks about reward systems. So that feel-good emotion. Noradrenaline um, is related to stress or high arousal, so um, that is that hormone there as well. Serotonin is that satisfaction hormone, so feeling very content. So we often see a disruption in that brain chemistry in people who have depression. Genetics can play a strong factor, so having a family history of depression. Having a neurochemical imbalance, so having really prolonged stress for a long period of time. And again, that kind of plays into this one as well, because we know that that is um, a stress hormone. Overuse of substances or substance abuse can have a, a play a role here. Some people who are ill and have to take medication, sometimes a side effect of that is depression. Having low or no supportive social structures can play a really strong role in getting depression as well. It's common in patients who are ill or experiencing a lot of pain or those who already have anxiety. And it's also really common in women. Okay, So um, if you want to have a look at some protective factors, that was a video from a little while ago. So ways that you can protect yourself against depression. Now, those who are especially at risk, so women slightly more than men, those of you who have a family history, substance abuse, um, those who've had it before, some personality types are predisposed to depression, so those who are highly perfection, are perfectionists, those who are highly introverted, those who struggle with assertiveness, that you know puts them at a little bit more of a risk of getting depression, and those who experience high levels of stress. Now, like I said, just because you are these things doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get depression. They're just some of the risk factors. So there's no causation, especially, but there, um, you know, there is a bit of a correlation with some of these. So 
how is depression treated? Now, cognitive behavior therapy is going to be no shocker for you here. So that is definitely one of the most common treatments of depression. And involved in that are things like pleasant event scheduling, problem solving, and also trying to tackle the thinking patterns behind depression. Now, medications, just like anxiety, they can be a helpful band-aid, I suppose, with some of these as well. But unlike anxiety, we don't want extreme relaxants. So we don't want the benzodiazepines. Uh, we want things like antidepressants and also serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So if there is a serotonin issue that is you know, adding or causing the depression, then that is something that can be addressed as well. Assertiveness training is something else that can be taught as part of this to try and treat depression. Now, electroconvulsive therapy is highly controversial. So it's very rarely used and it's often only used in very extreme cases of depression and involves delivering um, electric shocks to the brain, basically. So obviously by a professional. And the very last one here is something that people who have depression can do, and that's some coping strategies. So we've already talked about cognitive behavior therapy for anxiety, and we know that it involves tackling both unhelpful patterns of thoughts and also behaviors. So when we try and apply this to depression, pleasant event scheduling is a really important one because this is one of the most common um, symptoms of depression. So trying to schedule pleasant events, trying to um, bring those back into the patient's life and also try and get them enjoying them a little bit more as well. Problem solving, so really trying to tackle are there problems, are they actual problems or perceived problems, um, how to try and tackle those and it's usually quite a um, detailed structure for that as well. Now, just like with anxiety, depression can bring with it some quite unhealthy thinking patterns. So we had catastrophizing in anxiety, so thinking that the worst is going to happen all the time. In depression, we see things like um, feeling like everything is completely overwhelming, feeling really badly about yourself or feeling like you have no control over anything in your life. Those are really common un unhealthy thinking patterns in depression. Also to do with cognitive behavior therapy, we'll look at things like trying to manage stress, closely linked to problem solving, and also improving sleep hygiene because we know how important sleep is for us. Now, some of the things that people with depression can do are things like not comparing themselves to others, setting personal bests or goals or things that they want to achieve, trying to reframe setbacks, so not seeing them as the end of the world, um, and doing the same for mistakes, so making sure that they're viewed as being constructive. Avoiding thinking that begins with what if, you know, what if this happens, what if, and they usually think the worst. Trying to avoid panic as best as possible. Trying to tackle small tasks and do them well rather than doing a huge range of tasks poorly. And avoid complaining or venting too much. A little bit is helpful, but too much is unhelpful. And again, big ones here, so exercise, sleep, and nutrition. We know how important those are for our body, also uh, particularly for mental health. Structured daily activities, education about depression is also really helpful, and making sure that there's a strong social support there, so being involved, being around others. So this is an exam question from 2014, and it's asked about cognitive behavior therapy and how it can be used as a treatment. So this was a four mark question. Have a go and I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. Bye.